still find it very embarrassing when uh, people talk about you know the accolades and um, the awards won. You know, because for me, it's always just about really about doing things I love um, with people that I really truly admire um, for purposes that I really believe in. And uh, so, what I want to talk about today is the heart and essence of leadership, and share a little bit of my story. Um, growing up as growing up um, to become the leader that I am today and you know it's a far cry from someone who was born in a small town in Northern Ireland who immigrated here to Vancouver um, when I was a child and then we went back to Ireland and then we ended up in the States when I was a teenager so I moved around a lot and I really hated that actually when I was a child moving around a lot and but now as an adult I realize that all the things that even happen to you as a child um, create moments in your life that make you who you are. And sometimes even the struggles that you go through actually create you to be the leader that you're capable of being. So while I didn't like being the new kid at school all the time, what that taught me was how to adapt very quickly. And it taught me how to um, you know, assess new situations, and it also taught me how to be really comfortable in being myself and being different um, and actually liking being different and being comfortable in my own skin no matter where I was. So those lessons from my childhood actually carried me into my adulthood, even though at the time I thought they were some of the worst things possible, being the new girl yet again in another school. So I want to take you a little bit through um, some of my, in my business career, and um, I'm an entrepreneur just like all of you are, and I'm back starting a new company um, after Lululemon called Luvo, and our revenues uh, a year ago were $2 million, and this year they'll be about $10 million, and next year I think they'll be about $40 million. So, you know, how do you grow companies that, that fast? But I am also sitting here today on Fridays figuring out who I'm going to pay next week, managing my cash flow, um, you know, figuring out what I'm going to invest in next. Um, all the same things that each of you guys are doing every single day of the week, I'm doing as that entrepreneur. And just because you've run other companies before doesn't mean that you get out of any of the hard work um, that it takes to build a company. But why Luvo? I could have gone to work for a lot of other companies. And I had lots of offers from a lot of different companies. But for me, my next 10 years' work has to be something that I'm absolutely passionate about. And what I'm passionate about is bringing nutrition back into food. And if you look at the food industry today, um, it's full of chemicals, it's full of additives, um, and actually nobody talks about nutrition. And I'm very pleased that people talk about GMO, genetically modified organisms, being out of food. Um, I really just think it needs to be labeled. Um, and I'm very you know, proud of organics. But that's not the real story. The real story is we actually have to put nutrition in food. We have to take sugar out. We have to take sodium out. So creating meals that actually do that and put the right protein and fiber in um, actually, um, and that taste great, that are chef inspired, um, and bringing that with convenience to everybody so that we get ahead and show that the food industry can actually be disrupted and make this change so that we can actually in a healthy way provide food with a great business model. So that's what I'm up to with what I'm doing currently. So it's not just about being in the food manufacturing business, it's actually changing the way people eat and doing it so that we get ahead of this obesity and diabetes crisis. Because if you look 20 years into the future, with over 10.2% of the adult population having diabetes and 32 having um, obesity, we have forgotten how to eat in a healthy way with good fats, um, with proper nutrition, with reducing sugar and carbs. If we continue the way that we're going in 20 years, diabetes complications are limb loss, kidneys, vision loss, our quality of life as a society um, will be unsustainable. So I believe that as leaders, we have to do everything we can today um, to prevent that future from occurring and do it in a way that adds positive value. So that for me is what Luvo is. And Luvo is from Latin and it means to serve. And that's kind of pun intended, to serve food and to serve others. So that is what Luvo is about. But my journey began um, 
when I graduated from university with a degree in, in business and in IT, so I kind of had a, one of those first um, degrees that combined both of those in the early 80s. And I got a job right away because I could do spreadsheets and import one over the other without losing any data, and that really seemed like a big thing to people back then. It was a low bar. <laughs> Um, and so I started out in the financial services industry, building financial models, um, working in the private equity um, area. And so I, I learned um, about doing uh, equity raises for oil and gas, cable deals, um, public storage. Um, you know, I can't remember what some of the other deals we sold. And then I had my first child, who's now 28, and just about to get married. It's really great. Um, and I decided that I uh, would take some time off, and when I was coming back, they were moving offices, and I didn't want to move um, to uh, Bakersfield, California. So one of the clients I worked with said, I'm raising money for this guy, Howard Schultz, to do a little coffee shop, um, and he needs somebody to raise the money and run his office. Would you be interested? It looks like it'd be a little part-time gig and you could manage the, the family. And I said yes, and I went down and met him, and that was on Friday. And he called me all weekend long until I start, agreed to start. And then I started on the Monday. And my first day of work, Howard um, was gone, and so Dave Olson was the only other person. There were only three of us in the office and 14 people in the store. So that's the size of the company when I started. And Dave Olson spent two and a half hours teaching me how to run the espresso machine. And then he looked at me and said, payroll was due on Friday. That's why Howard wanted you to start today. So you have to have the checks ready by 4. And I hadn't done payroll except in theory in class. And then Dave left to go open his other cafe that he ran. So I sat at my desk till lunch hour. And then I went down to the Department of Labor and Industries, picked up a pamphlet, drove back, read it, and had those checks ready by 4 o'clock. So that was my first day on the job at uh, Il Giornale, which was the company that Howard started when he left Starbucks. We raised the money um, successfully. We built out to five stores. The second uh, store was actually here at, um, in Vancouver at the C-Bus terminal, and we had to figure out how to get everything there. Then we went to um, um, do a second raising, and because the founders of Starbucks wanted to sell. So we did the second raising, and then we did a third one, and then the companies merged together. And people often ask me, like, why did I go to work and take that chance with Howard Schultz? And the reason I took that job was, was three things. Number one, he had a vision for a commodity product, um, which coffee was at the time. It was 50 cents. Um, and said, you can personalize this cup of coffee and bring community back um, to everybody by creating third place. That's what I want to do. So it was coffee with a purpose and values, and he wanted to um, provide health care to all of his employees. And so he got up every day wanting to change the world. And that was really important to me, that this wasn't just a job. It was even from the early days, because I'd been living in the financial industry, and I'd seen money go a lot of different places. And um, but what I didn't see was values being created, or I wasn't really connected to what I was doing. So this, for me, was a really big deal. And so when we merged the two companies together, um, I got all the jobs nobody wanted, um, or the people that had quit in the transfer. So I found myself running the receiving desk um, at the shipping and receiving, and uh, inventory control, and procurement, and new store development. And we were building about five stores a year. When I left um, the store development area, we were building 350 stores a year and had a network um, of uh, construction and store designers and had built out that department. And I went on then to run um, various other functions in the company. And um, by the time I stepped away and got a, uh, my degree from Harvard, came back, and uh, then I ran um, 10 countries in Asia out of Hong Kong. And the greatest blessing of that was seeing our culture at Starbucks in 10 other countries, in Japan, in China, in Indonesia, um, you know, Thailand, Malaysia. I mean, it was a fantastic experience bringing the Starbucks experience to each of those cultures, countries and recognizing it had to be done differently but create the same thing. So the gift back to me, though, was I actually got to see who North America was to all these other countries and what I represented. And looking back um, inside, 
um, and recognizing the value of global business, of diversity, of um, inclusion, and that there are shared values across cultures when you deal with people with respect and dignity. After 20 years at Starbucks, I hung up my hat and took a year off to be with my family. I have three children. Um, they're 28, 25, and 15. And um, I wanted a year just to be um, me and to spend time with my husband. Um, we've been married uh, over 30 years, college sweethearts. Um, so I'm also really proud of that, that um, in spite of, you know, not in spite, but in addition to everything that's happened in my career, that I've got this amazing family. And I consider my greatest accomplishment the amount of love I have in my life. And so after my year off, I, I get this call from somebody I'd met in my travels and um, speaking engagements, and that was Chip Wilson. And he asked, would I come up and talk to him about taking over um, Lululemon? And so I went up and talked to him, and what I loved about Lululemon was the disruption again, this taking this idea of um, you know, feminine clothing and making it athletic, but also bringing yoga and the philosophy of yoga into business and into leadership. And on that, Chip and I were you know, very aligned. So I stepped in after Bob Mears, the first CEO, was retiring. And, um, and had an incredible journey and learned so many great things about myself and about business um, at, at Lululemon. And also, probably some of the biggest things I learned was um, who you have to be as a leader. And taking on that mantle um, of leader really requires that you know yourself. Because when you're the CEO, and this was my first CEO role, um, what you learn is that without understanding the essence of yourself and where your leadership comes from, you really can't lead others and that values. And as CEO, you have to own the culture and every moment that you're creating with other people. So that moment you walk by other people and don't say hello, or mainly because you're probably thinking about the next meeting or something you have to get to, what everybody else sees is you didn't see them. And as a leader, what people want most from you is being seen. And they want to know that their contribution and sense of belonging matters. So I've defined um, a few things about leadership that I want to talk to you today. And um, the first one is like even defining what leadership means to me. So it means two things. The first is creating a future that would not otherwise occur. So am I doing the things that will create the change that I want to see attached to that vision and that purpose? And am I doing only the things that I can do as a CEO? And am I letting others do the things that they need to do to contribute to this vision and plan? So the second part of that is creating the space for other people to perform. As a CEO and a leader, we often um, think of ourselves as the boss or the source of power. The actual reality is we are, should be an ember to other people's flame that how we lead is actually by creating the flame in others. Because as your organizations grow, you cannot simply be the person who makes every decision. And that's one of the things I've seen from kind of founder-led, iconic you know, leader companies to really well-led companies based on strategy and vision and a team approach. And if you don't empower that team and create belonging and allow contribution, good people will leave you. Because what are they looking for? that ability to contribute, that ability to belong and be valued for those contributions. So you as a leader have to shift off your individual contributor and power hat and put on the empowerment hat to create an organization that's going to grow and create the type of value that you want. You cannot do the journey alone. The second is knowing yourself and self-awareness. Um, you know, I grew up in a very Irish family um, we weren't very wealthy, but we were rich in Irish wisdom. And, you know, I have so many great gifts that I've gotten from, you know, particularly my father and his uh, great sayings. You know, um, nobody in my family can sing except my brother. We're horrible. We're not even close to on key or on tune. But every time we would sing, we would sing loudly. And our dad would, my dad would ruffle our head and eat hair and he'd say, it's all right, darling, you're just leaving room for the talent of others. <laughs> And, and he was right, and what I experienced and what I grew up with was admiring my brother, the singer. 
admiring my sister, you know, the athlete, admiring, you know, so I didn't experience envy. I didn't experience less in myself because I didn't know how to sing, because uh, my parents were really good at always telling us what we were great at, what our gifts were, and so that is such a gift, and I realized looking back in my life that is what gave me the strength to be different, to be myself, to have that confidence, because I don't have that little voice in my head saying I'm not enough and that I'm less than in comparison to others. And that was such a great gift to give me, as, and it, it set my courage loose as even as a child to try so many different things to see if it would be the thing that I had a talent for. And so I always looked at things as, um, this is my opportunity to see if this is my talent, as opposed to if it wasn't, then it was somebody else's to carry, and I would celebrate that. And as leaders, I think that's a really important trait um, that we have is celebrating the gifts of others and bringing them into our circle and not being afraid or living a life of comparison or not enough. Um, the other thing about leadership is it starts with leading yourself. And that means knowing yourself and taking responsibility for yourself. The second part of leadership is leading others. And most people think that means the people who are down here um, that report to you. And it couldn't be farther from the truth, because it's actually about leading cross-functional teams. It's about leading peers. It's about creating an environment where cross-functional work um, matters. And when you lead others, then everybody else can do their work. And leading other means having a clear vision, purpose, and communication. And then you have leading organizations. And that's where you have to build high-performance teams and where you have to understand and be good at the technical work. And you have to develop others in order to be able to lead organizations. So it's about having functional discipline. It's about creating great peer relationships. Um, because the other thing that my dad used to always say to me was, that when you go to work, problems are what you go to solve every day, opportunities what you go to pursue, and relationships are what allow you to do it, just like your family. And that has served me well as well, because problems occur. And sometimes we think that the problems are our fault as leaders, and they're not. You can't choose the water that you sail in. You can only choose how you sail and who you do it with. So having that. Um, you know, taking responsibility for problems, but without owning problems as they're our fault. Um, and so having that problem-solving mindset has really been important to every job I've done. Um, so I just go in and get to work. And first you start with what you know how to do, then you ask your people a lot of questions, and then you let people contribute. You find the best answer, you start working it, and you just keep doing that cycle until you find the answer that works. And that's how I've always led my teams, has been through that um, really important philosophy. And I've already talked to this a little bit about passion. You know, for me, um, you know, Christina just said, well, you look great. And um, I wouldn't guess that you've had this incredibly hard summer of work. And I said, you know, my response was, the reason is because I'm doing what I'm passionate about. And so I just think about it all the time. And hard work doesn't feel like hard work, because it matters to me. And so I'm always thinking about what it looks like to be successful in the space that I'm in. And when you come from that space and you feel valued doing it, hard work isn't hard work. Um, but hard work is a talent too. And that's one of my things that my dad always said about me was um, you know how to work hard. You know how to go the extra mile. And the good news is it's less crowded out there. And so sometimes if you don't have a lot of other talents, just knowing how to work hard is a pretty darn good one. And the other one I've talked about a little bit, um, besides passion and working hard, um, is, being, is being bold. You know, if you don't take those steps for yourself, and I think this is a really important one for women leaders, some of the best advice I got from anybody um, when I was working was somebody said to me, wouldn't it be a shame if the best golfer ended up being the best caddy? And what he was pointing out to me was I was really good at being a servant leader and helping others and being a staff and support member, and I make sure everybody had the right stick to play the game. But he was challenging me that I was good enough to be on um, in the tournament and play on stage, get out there and run a business unit. And that's when I changed from staff roles into running um, the Northwest Zone for, for Starbucks. 
And I learned I could play um, just as well as anybody out there. But if I hadn't had that push to be bold um, and to take the leadership reins, then you know, I might have ended up in a very different place, very successful, but not maybe making the contribution that I'm actually capable of making in the world. So you know, it's um, what uh, my dad used to always joke and say to me was, you know, be brave and get out there and do something um, that makes people talk around the water cooler. Um, because if you don't, then you'll be the one talking about the person who did at the water cooler. And which would you rather be? And because people are going to talk anyways, do something that's bold and exciting and different that causes disruption and changes the world. So, you know, the other thing I've talked about in each of the business models is being a disruptor. What I loved um, about, you know, Starbucks was the fact that it changed the world of commodity coffee and it brought personalization and customization back in. So it was this new twist on um, the way that the world saw coffee. Lululemon was the same thing. Luvo, I hope to be the same thing. A twist on food bringing the nutrition back, disrupting that frozen aisle that's been in double digit declines because people are rejecting the product. But yet we know at Whole Foods and you know, companies like Trader Joe's and in Europe, um, particularly in Europe, frozen food is up 47%. Why? Because it's nature's preservative. And with today's flash freezing um, techniques, it uh, produces better food than ever. Everything's picked right at its peak. But we have this very disconnected um, you know, notion of what frozen food is because what we've been served on those two aisles is really bad. So if we have that opportunity to take all that real estate and actually create healthy food, I see a future of over 200 SKUs from my company um, on those aisles that's reinvented healthy food. And that equals a billion dollar business. So reinventing and disrupting a category and thinking big um, and seeing the space that nobody's seen before. And the tricky part about that is there's no evidence because all the people with evidence will tell you frozen food, and this is when I went out and talked to people about what I wanted to do next, people thought I was crazy. It's double digit declines, pizza's the main seller, you, you know, nobody will pay more than a buck for 10. Um, and I'm like getting more excited and they couldn't understand why I'm getting more excited. And I'm like, disruption, it's perfect. Um, it's like it needs to be reinvented. And when you see that moment and you see something, um, it's really powerful and it's a lesson I learned when Starbucks went to Japan and this big um, consulting company came in and produced this big deck and they recommended you know that the existing um, coffee drinker in Japan was male they needed to smoke and we needed more seating in the afternoon so they could fall asleep in the chairs and Howard Schultz walked over and he picked up the presentation and he walked over to the garbage can and he dumped it and he said you only see what's there not what could be I have no more time for you and that, I was like, you know, in shock because I'm sitting there with all these guys in suits and Howard just left the room. And why? Because they had produced all the evidence for what is, but not the opportunity for what could be. So thinking into that opportunity for what could be is where business opportunity lies. And when you get that disruption and you get all the crowd telling you this is where something is, that's when you know the moment to go, the, go to the right is actually a big opportunity two pieces of advice are also be in your business. You know, I've talked about how it's not hard work for me because I live and breathe it. If I was at the airport and I'm reading the magazine aisle, I am literally looking through all of the headlines. Um, I used to do it on yoga, how many times yoga was mentioned. And it used to get to like, I was up to 13 magazine counts and five in the men's section, yoga and golf. I mean, I was thrilled because then I knew what we were doing had made a, a really different shift and change. Um, by being in the front line in the stores, um, you learn where your business is at. When I had to go and transform a declining Japanese business, my first two um, visits were to the office. And my third visit, um, I was listening to a presentation and they were explaining why strawberry frappuccino sales were not where they should be and their conclusion was the Japanese didn't like strawberries. And I'm like, you're the third biggest importer of strawberries in the world. I don't think that's the problem. So I made them all get up, 
get in, I arranged for two cars, and we went out and visited 10 stores. And what I saw and had them see was the presentation they were showing me about the marketing program they were executing did not live in the stores. So if you walked into the store, the poster was an art piece up, in, up over here. It wasn't back here. The managers had chosen not to order the strawberry showcase. Like, where's your strawberry message? How do you expect to sell any strawberries? And there was a total disconnect between what was occurring in the office and what was occurring on the front lines. So if you aren't out there on the front lines of your business and watching what's happening, both in trends and actual performance in your store, going out there, I used to go out to my stores and ask my managers, what is the stupidest thing we've done? And you know, I said, because you've met me, I, I'm not a stupid person. So if there's something stupid out there, you've got to know that I don't want that to happen. And I found really funny answers. We'd implemented this new program um, to speed up the lines at Starbucks. And it was that they should ring at peak periods 50% of um, open two registers, and so that 50% of the sales went through two registers. Somehow that got confused to the metric of that you had to get 50% in um, the second cash register. So what happened, I went into a store, and the person ran all the way down to the end to ring me in, and then came all the way back and rang me drink, and I said, what are you doing? And he goes, well, I've got to ring 50% of the sales in that cash register over there. And I'm like, God, you know? It became about the metric instead of the purpose. And the purpose was, if a customer, it takes a minute to ring people in, and there's 10 minutes in line, if you have two registers open, you get people through twice as fast, and then they are more comfortable waiting for their drink once they've given their order. But we lost purpose and got metric. And so when you get a metric that doesn't mean anything to anybody, you get people doing really stupid things. And so staying connected to purpose and also being out there and watching what's happening in your stores and asking those questions, you'll learn more about your business. Um, you know, they'd always cringe when I'd go on the store tours because I'd come back with 50 ideas of what we could do better. And then, you know, then you have to paste 50 ideas in. Um, but even if I could get one of them across the line, I was always excited. And the last one for me is working with great people and, um, and people who treat you like great people. And because life's too short uh, to be working either for or with uh, people who aren't great people. And I think as women in particular, we try to fix people. And um, the reality is you can't, only people can be responsible for themselves. We can lend helping hands and we can support people, but we can't carry them. And what I've learned about leadership and what's gotten me the ability to make the tough calls sometime, er, easier is that when I realize that the people who pay the price are actually the peers who have to work harder, me who have to work harder, and the, the, the failure and risk to the business um, is too big. So when you actually look at it that way, the person who wants to be in a job that's probably bigger than they are or who's not willing to be coached or not willing to grow or try hard is actually very selfish. And when I started seeing it from that perspective that the hand wasn't going two ways, um, then I couldn't invest my time in that person and it was probably a valuable lesson that they needed to, lead, to, to learn. And that includes too, if you find yourself working for someone um, who never sees the value um, in what you're doing. And life's too short. And there are a lot of other opportunities if you're smart and hardworking um, to pursue. And because what it does is it damages the essence of who you are. And I really hope you do something a little braver um, today and make that little connection or be a little bolder and ask that question or for help you need um, because you've been here today. Thank you, everyone.